This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Guido Yuat. It's Monday, April 13th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at our VOA headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on and we appreciate your staying with us on Africa 54. As the deadly coronavirus infiltrates communities around the world, U.S. President Donald Trump is signaling his desire for economic activity to return to normal as soon as possible. But top administration officials are being cautious, advising people to stay home if they can through the end of April. Top infectious disease expert Dr. Anthony Fauci says that he thinks some of those measures could be lifted as early as next month but only if the ability exists to quickly identify anyone who becomes infected, isolate them, and track down who they've been in contact with. Worldwide, there are currently more than 1.85 million confirmed cases of the coronavirus, with at least 114,000 deaths, according to Johns Hopkins University statistics. The United States account for more than 550,000 cases, the World Health Organization says it's looking into reports of COVID-19, patients testing positive again after clinically recovering from the disease. Now to Africa, where several countries are demanding that China address their concerns that Africans in particular in the southern city of Guangzhou are being mistreated and harassed. Africans in the city report being ejected from their apartments, being tested for COVID-19 several times, without being given results and being shunned and discriminated against in public. Meanwhile, a lockdown in Monrovia, Liberia got off to a rocky start at the weekend as some law enforcement officers used their police clubs against residents who had ventured outside in search of provisions. Confusion reigned as residents erroneously learned via social media that the government had ordered a 3 p.m. to 6 a.m. curfew rather than a full lockdown. The United States Food and Drug Administration Commissioner says the models show America is close to the peak of the coronavirus outbreak with federal social distancing guidelines due to expire at the end of April. But exactly when the economy will be back up again is still too early to tell. Viewers Elizabeth Lee explains. When life will be back to normal is still uncertain in the U.S. If you look at what we're doing, we're looking at a date. We hope we're going to be able to fulfill a certain date, but we're not doing anything until we know that this country is going to be healthy. Even when the economy opens up again, White House officials expect to see new cases of coronavirus. The response will include a diagnostic test and a new antibody test to see if anybody who has already been exposed may have immunity. U.S. President Donald Trump says there is no need for mass testing across the country, but something more strategic as to who gets tested and focusing on hotspots. The Food and Drug Administration Commissioner Stephen Hahn says several factors should be considered. Including the underlying characteristics of the person, you know, whether they're more susceptible to a more serious outcome from COVID-19, where they live, what the prevalence of the disease is in the environment, and whether they've had a diagnostic test that's positive previously or not. One factor is statistics showing the coronavirus is disproportionately affecting Black and Latino communities which led the U.S. Surgeon General to deliver this message. We need you to understand, especially in communities of color, we need you to step up and help stop the spread so that we can protect those who are most vulnerable. An emerging hotspot is Baltimore, Maryland, near Washington, D.C., which is predominantly African-American. An almost completed study found African-Americans make up more than half of the coronavirus deaths in Maryland. But they are only 31 percent of the state's population. Well, this uh, disparity among African-Americans is very disturbing. The vast majority of our resources are focused on that Baltimore-Washington corridor and these communities that you're talking about. In the meantime, White House officials are struggling with a date for things to be back to normal again. I'm going to have to make a decision, and I only hope to God that it's the right decision. 
But I would say without question, it's the biggest decision I've ever had to make. As Mr. Trump weighs health data and safety with a toll the pandemic is taking on the economy. Elizabeth Lee, VOA News. Coronavirus cases in the United States doubled last week. According to U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, more than 500,000 Americans have been diagnosed with COVID-19. But some say life will never be the same, even for those who will not contract the disease. VOA's Caroline Persuti explains how the U.S. is ending up with two different populations. You have probably already noticed the split. There are those who are sick, I went to get up and I just collapsed on the floor because I was so sick, like my body just couldn't move. And there are those who do not have the coronavirus. There are those who are teleworking and getting paid. And there are those who are out of work. It's just a scary, you know, another scary aspect of this whole thing. It's just shutting every too much down. In Arkansas, hundreds of residents lined up at an unemployment office when online applications failed. I'm 62, don't know a lot about the computer. In Florida, there are lines at a drive through unemployment office. This is 10 times worse than we've seen in a generation. About one in 10 U.S. workers lost their jobs in the past three weeks. The $2 trillion stimulus package will help the unemployed. But Ben Harris of Northwestern University says benefits are not immediately available. In practice, states are not set up to actually deliver them. So the fact that the federal government said in the legislation, look, our intention is for you to actually get the money if you're self-employed or a gig worker. In practice, those people are going to have to wait, hopefully just a few more weeks, but maybe much longer to get their benefits. They're going to pay a price. In Cook County, which includes Chicago, a disproportionate number of African Americans are coronavirus patients, a rate three times higher than that of white patients. Business experts predict sickness leads to unemployment, especially for lower income workers, which leads to bankruptcies, businesses, and personal. Even if we were told to go back to work tomorrow, I mean, most, the average working family, you know, is only a couple of weeks away from not being able to pay bills. Analysts predict two populations are emerging in the coronavirus pandemic. Some struggling to eat and to get medical care. Um, we have a lot of stuff in our fridge. Others discussing dinner or takeout while the children finish online learning. Carolyn Persuti, VOA News. An Internet Technology Alliance of 30 African countries and 40 private sector players is currently working on an integrated platform that will support member states as they work to contain the spread of COVID-19. VOA's Jackson Bugani spoke to Lassine Kone, head of Rwanda-based Smart Africa in Kigali. He asks him about some of the shortfalls in the IT infrastructure that were exposed by the current lockdown in many African cities. When the coronavirus pan pandemic actually uh, uh, broke out and uh, it, uh, it actually represented a lot of challenges for uh, African countries in general. The first one is the broadband connectivity. On the continent, we have about 34 to 35% according to GSMA penetration of broadband connectivity. That's a challenge. Why is it a challenge? Because a lot of government initiative uh, are encouraging people to work from home, to be able to work from home you need to be able to connect, Right. one thing. Second thing, the government has been calling people to do, okay, we're gonna continue business as usual. How can we continue business as usual if the government services have not come online yet? So it becomes a second challenge. Mm. The government also initiative, another initiative is schools are closed, so students uh, in Europe or uh, in America, students are actually doing, they're not sitting home, they're actually uh, uh, continuing their courses. But in Africa, kids, our kids are sitting home. Why? Because we don't have an e-education platform and distance learning platform for e-school. So it becomes a big challenge. On the top of that, when you add cybersecurity, you know, more on people coming on online at this time, time of, uh, at this time, a period of time, you have also a cybersecurity uh, causing another issue, another challenge. What are some of the interventions you're proposing as a Smart Africa? Yeah, when this crisis starts, you know, uh, you, you really have to say no one was expecting this. 
And uh, of course, you imagine like every single country, like anywhere else in the world, a country will be running around to find a solution. What do they do? Uh, and the nature of this virus actually, which is uh, you, can ha you have some people who are asymptomatic, I mean, they're sick, they don't even know, and they are contagious. How do you manage all of these in the African context? It becomes a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. And one thing I meant to say also is the fact that the mobile penetration is very high in Africa, but not everyone owns a smartphone. But at least most of the people who own, most of the people, total mobile penetration is about 444 million and out of the 1.3 billion population. Out of that, only 250 million has a smartphone. Smartphone, so, right. it means how do you track, how do you track people? So a lot of people, a lot of countries started, you know, manual uh, tracking, infectious uh, uh, people, and uh, who they've been with for the past three days, where did they come from? It becomes a really big challenge. All right. So this is the health aspect of it in, in terms of contact yes. tracing uh, and 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 providing, I guess, information and advice to people who might be potentially. Uh, infected. You're basically crowdsourcing uh, information and then you put together on a platform. I'm trying to think of how this will manifest itself. What the platform is all about. It, it's all about organization and harmonization because Smart Africa is about stakeholders management. So we inform the ICT Council of Ministers of Smart Africa. This is the initiative we are going to take. We call for project proposal. So from that, that solutions will help you do assessment in terms of health-wise. It will help you also use artificial intelligence to inform, communicate with the population, rural area, in their own language. Because we here in the city, we always think that everyone speaks English or everyone speaks French. Mm -hmm. There's a huge part of the populations in Africa who do not understand Imagine. other language than their the local language. So that will be the communication part of it. And also that will allow us to actually fight a lot of fake news happening today on the social media. Because today, if you look at it, really what the social media does to people is actually more than the disease itself. Then how are you able to achieve, how do you think you're going to be able to achieve it given some of the, the deficiencies in the, the digital infrastructure that you mentioned, we talked about earlier? Uh, on the top of the project, coming up with the projects, once we go through the selection process, then the process and so on and so forth, we come up with the two to three solutions. On the other hand, we are actually reaching out to our partners, institutional partners and private partners to fund these initiatives for a project to come out. So once this is done, then we will approach each single country. You know, we are in touch with them because remember, the task force we're putting together, countries are part of it. We wrote to them, we need a point of contact from your organization who will be working with Smart Africa together to go through the selection process. Mm. And once this is done and the platform comes out and the countries are free to use. VOS Jackson Bugani is speaking with Lassim Kone, head of Rwanda-based Smart Africa in Kigali. Share prices fell in Asia Monday as investors prepared for the week's earnings. Reports from U.S. corporate giants giving them a glimpse of how the coronavirus pandemic has stifled the global economy. Japan's Nikkei index ended the trading day with a 2.3% loss, while the indexes in Shanghai and Taipei lost around one half of 1% on average. Financial markets in Hong Kong and Australia and other regional markets were closed Monday in observance of the Easter holiday. The markets in London, Paris and Frankfurt are also closed for the holiday. Oil markets were on the rise Monday after a historic deal was reached between OPEC nations and Russia to cut oil production to nearly 10 million barrels a day as demand falls due to COVID-19 pandemic and a price war between Saudi Arabia and Russia sent oil price crashing. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also, check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, Uganda's president demonstrates how to work out indoors during the COVID-19 mandated lockdown. We'll be right back after this short break. Yo, check it out, man. This is Kuna Paso, 
Welcome back to Africa 54. Some international students in China are feeling relieved as the lockdown in Wuhan, China is being lifted after the COVID-19 outbreak, but they remain concerned about the families back home as the virus has spread to more than 170 countries. Saha Majid has more in this report narrated by Catherine Strzok. When the COVID-19 virus broke out in China, more than 20 countries evacuated their citizens from Wuhan. But many foreign students chose to stay or could not afford to leave. This is one student speaking back in February. I think it's a very big risk for me to go back right now, so I would like to stay here. If any mistakes happen and I go back to my home and uh, in 14 days I will already be like uh, contaminated people around me. Two months later, students emerging from lockdown are sharing their thoughts with family members back home where the number of confirmed cases is growing. The situation has improved here a lot, about 80 to 90 percent. But we are still worried, as coronavirus has now affected many other countries, including Pakistan. And now we are concerned about our families back home. Other international students say they want to leave Wuhan and have asked their governments to return them home. There is a sharp decline in the number of people affected by coronavirus in Wuhan. We are still feeling unsafe, though, which is adding to our depression, anxiety and fear with each passing day. The government of Pakistan evacuated 6,000 pilgrims from Iran. We are requesting the government to help us and send us back to Pakistan. Some countries remain hesitant to return citizens from Wuhan, and parents are frustrated. We will continue our protests until our children are brought back. We have no other demand. We only need our children back, who are dangling between life and death. They are falling victim to depression. And Janatun Nahar, the student who stayed in Wuhan to limit the spread to her home country, remains worried about her family. And right now, I don't really regret uh, to stay here, but uh, it, make, it makes me sad that um, uh, back home, the situation is not... Uh, okay, and uh, um, I cannot get the real, um, I cannot get any idea what's going on there. As the lockdown in Wuhan is lifted, a date for students to return to the classroom remains unclear. For Sahar Majid, Kathleen Strzok, VOA News, Washington. As the world struggles to fight the coronavirus pandemic, one of the unexpected outcomes has been a decrease in nitrogen dioxide pollution, resulting in cleaner skies in cities across Asia, Europe, and the United States. Here is VOA's Maria Madiello. The European Space Agency says China experienced a 20 to 30 percent drop of the air pollutant nitrogen dioxide from between mid-December to mid-March. It was certainly due to the fact that in the Hubei region in China, all activities were reduced dramatically due to the lockdown. Beatrice Cardenas of the World Resources Institute in Mexico explains how nitrogen dioxide affects the air. What it does once it's in the atmosphere is not only it, it has some impacts on the environment and health of the people, but it's also it's a key pollutant uh, in terms of atmospheric chemistry. Because once it's in the atmosphere, it can react with other pollutants to uh, produce other pollutants. All that pollution makes it harder to stay healthy. Being exposed to air pollutants make you more vulnerable to infections like this virus or bacteria. Analysis by Greenpeace also shows the pollutant emissions in Beijing and its surrounding areas dropped. Compared to previous years, streets and landmarks are no longer covered in smog. 
Lin Liu is a senior climate and energy campaigner with Greenpeace. In fact, there are a lot of reasons behind the warming of the global heat wave. But there are two main factors. One is that the shutdown of the epidemic. The other is the change of people's lives, especially the reduction of traffic. Beijing resident Liu Chuan takes this as a potential health benefit. It feels like the air is overall much less polluted than it used to be. It also improves people's mood. In Europe, cities including Madrid, Brussels, Paris, Milan, and Frankfurt also showed a reduction in average levels of nitrogen dioxide, according to the Sentinel-5 satellite images. In America, Los Angeles, a city with one of the worst smog problems in the country, is experiencing a third straight week of clean air. All this is leading some to wonder if stay-at-home orders are helping to reduce pollution levels. California scientists are looking at the data, but say they haven't reached a conclusion. Human activities uh, that cause emissions have been uh, diminished, it has rained every other day or every third day, and under those conditions, those are the days where we typically see uh, very good air quality days. Cardenas says whether it's related to a decrease in human activity or weather patterns, there are some lessons to be learned when this is all over. Mariama Diallo, VOA News. The elderly are among the most vulnerable to the coronavirus. Friends, neighbors and local organizations are stepping up to assist older people who are sheltering in place. The volunteers run errands like food shopping or picking up medication. VOA's Dora McQua reports for VOA's Wan Cheng Chao. Retired teacher Donna Eason, who is 78 years old, delivers groceries to her friend Phyllis King, a seamstress who is isolating at home due to the coronavirus pandemic. Oh, hi, Donna. <laughs> How are you doing? Is this for me? Yeah, that's for you. Oh, thank you. That's so kind of you. <laughs> Times like these are very trying and very hard, especially for older people like myself. And fortunately, I'm in good health and everything, so I'm able to do a little bit. And while I can, I will. Eason and King, who is 75, are friends. Since the outbreak, King says her customers have stopped visiting, but many call to check in and ask if she needs help. They're business acquaintances. They're not friends of mine, and yet they've reached out to me and have wanted to do anything for me. Go to the pharmacy, go to the supermarket, um, pick up anything. People have just been wonderful. A Rotary Club in Maryland, just outside of Washington, is also coming to the aid of seniors. I wanted to help out the elderly, that there's several elderly in my club who are 65 and over. So I said, hey guys, you know, if anybody needs something, just let me know and I will help you and a few other Members who are younger were like, yes, no, me let us know. We will help as well. Seniors like King welcome any help. She says the support reminds her of what she's heard about solidarity during World War II. During the Second World War, people came together because things were so bad. And I believe this is another war we are fighting. And people are coming together and trying so hard to help each other. Through that, we will overcome. For VOA Mandarin's Wan Cheng Chow, this is Dora McQuar in Washington. In sports and fitness news, Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni has released a video showing Ugandans how to keep fit during a nationwide lockdown. He also issues a warning that too many are exercising outdoors. David Doyle reports. Uganda's president, Yoweri Museveni, released a workout video on Thursday, showing citizens how to keep fit in confined spaces while under a national lockdown. The day before, the 75-year-old had told his followers on Twitter that too many people were exercising outdoors. You can do as many laps as you want. In the video, he jogs across his spacious office before doing press-ups. His final count was 30. And Museveni isn't the only African president to get in front of the camera. In Liberia, which declared a state of emergency on Wednesday, President George Weir released a music video in which he urges people to stand together. 
David Doyle of Reuters with that report. Now, more women in the United States are participating in the traditional male-dominated sport of weightlifting. VOA's Pfizer L. Maswe visited a gym in Rosedale, Maryland, to find out how the sport is really taking off. My name is Mariel Gaviola. I work as a proofreader for a financial investment company in Baltimore. I have a competition next week, um, and it's probably my sixth competition or so. I started competing in 2018 or 2017, um, and since then I've had about like six gold medals in my weight classes. I think in the U.S. weightlifting has actually really hit the ground running. I think social media has a great um, kind of view on weightlifting and women nowadays. It's a very good message to see that women can be strong instead of just slender. Something we're beautiful outside of just, you know, our physical appearances. A lot of the times I'll hear women aren't supposed to be lifting heavy weight. You're going to get injured. Your anatomy is not built for this. You can't compete with men. You're too small. In my experience, women and men can handle pretty much the same workload. There's about 52 to 55% men at this gym and you know about 45% women here. You know, sometimes a male with an ego will come in here and very quickly have to check his ego because he sees that there are women in here lifting more weight than he is. I started lifting here about a year and a half ago. And before that, I did CrossFit for a year. Weightlifting has a lot of benefits to me. The biggest one, obviously, is the physical side of things. Uh, seeing the improvement in body composition and strength has been tremendous. Uh, the other side of things is obviously the mental. So this is my stress relief. So it's kind of my outlet. It's also my social life since I spend so many hours here. It's okay for women to be strong and powerful. I think there was a, a stigma for a long time that women weren't allowed to have muscles. Women are taking this sport very seriously and noticing that they're not getting big and bulky like they were worried about, but they're getting toned and fit and coordinated and strong and more confident. And, you know, that's just a great thing for anybody. You can't let um, like the stereotypes around you affect how you feel and what you want to pursue. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thanks for watching.